I'd like to welcome everybody here today. Um, it is a very, very exciting day. I am so proud uh, to announce that I introduced uh, a private member's bill today, seconded by my colleague, uh, Daniel Blakey, the Member of Parliament for Transcona Elmwood, the National Framework for a Guaranteed Livable Basic Income Act. Um, before I begin, I would like to give a number of thank yous to Basic Income Canada Network, Basic Income Manitoba, Coalition Canada, Basic Income Canada Youth Network, Senator Kim Pate, former Senator Hugh Siegel, and many other anti-poverty activists from across the country who contributed uh, to the development uh, of this very uh, exciting uh, bill. So the National Framework for a Guaranteed uh, Basic Income Act is in response to calls to implement a guaranteed livable basic income from Indigenous, provincial, territorial and municipal governments who recognize that we are desperately in need to modernize our social safety net. Uh, a JLBI is not a panacea in itself, but it's a way forward to modernize our social safety net in addition to current and future government programs and supports. It will ensure that all people all people have the necessary supports and resources to live in dignity, security, respect, and with human rights as affirmed in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And what we've learned during the pandemic is that our social security safety net is patchwork and it's insufficient for our present day. So many people are beginning to fall and fall through the cracks. And those who were behind prior to the pandemic are now even um, further behind. Uh, for example, the CERB placed many young people aging out of care into poverty, many who are now having to cope with clawbacks after collecting CERB. We know we know that the current rates of social assistance are not enough for families and individuals to survive on, leaving too many in precarious situations. This is becoming more pronounced. With rates of inflation and cutbacks to the current pandemic programs that are sinking more and more individuals and families into deeper, deeper levels of poverty. And we also know. This government has failed to call a CERB amnesty and too many individuals uh, who received the CERB are now facing dire financial situations. Many people with disabilities and almost 90,000 low-income seniors. Campaign 2000 just released a report that 1.3 1, 1 children live in poverty and 1.5 children, uh, 1. 1. 1.3 million children live in poverty and one in five children live in poverty in Canada. There is no excuse. There is no reasoning. There is no justification that so many seniors and children are denied their human rights to live in dignity in Canada. And we know that even with the child tax benefit, we know that fewer, fewer children are being lifted out of poverty and it's not providing adequate support, especially for families living in deep levels of poverty. And let's not forget Single individuals, 15% of older single individuals who live in poverty in this country, and the fact that persons with disabilities account for 41% of those who live in poverty. One in five BIPOC families live in po poverty in Canada, compared to one in 20 non-BIPOC families. And while we see people struggle, over 250,000 households in Canada have accumulated over $350 million in rental arrears. 
since the start of the pandemic, we must ensure that we don't have a growing issue uh, in the housing crisis in this country. We must ensure that all people living in Canada are afforded their right to housing. And while this disparity grows, the Liberal government continues to prop up their corporate friends. They need to start investing in people first and not corporations. They need to end offshore tax havens and they need to start taxing the wealthy. I'll give you an example. While people become go into deeper levels of poverty in this country, Canadian bil billionaires' wealth was increased by $78 billion during the pandemic, while children, families, and seniors become increasingly food insecure and unhoused. And this bill is about changing the way we govern in this country, putting people first and not corporations, because governing should always be about investing in people first and not corporations. And this includes divesting from corporate bailouts, ending offshore tax havens, and taxing the wealthy. In fact, in 2018, if we want to talk about government waste, this, in a 2018 CRA study on illegal tax dodging and a 2019 PBO report on legal tax dog dodging, Canadians are missing out on as much as $51 billion a year in uncollected taxes in places such as offshore tax havens and tax avoidance schemes. This would help pay for a guaranteed livable basic income for those in need. And according to the International Monetary Fund report, Canada subsidized the fossil fuel industry to the tune of almost $60 billion in 2015, approximately $1,650 per Canadian. This would pay for a guaranteed livable basic income. And we know when an economy is inclusive and no one is abandoned to poverty or prevented by poverty, we support healthy communities. It's time to talk about the high costs of poverty. And poverty costs a lot of money. For example, in Ontario alone, a Conservative estimate on the cost of poverty is between 27.1 and $33 billion a year in Canada, including... $7.6 billion it costs the Canadian health care system alone. That is a political choice, and keeping people poor is a political choice. We need a government, and we need this government to support this bill to ensure that all people can live with human rights and dignity. And we also know if we're talking about how to save money to pay for a guaranteed livable income, that in Canada alone, it costs $7.6 billion poverty in the Canadian health care system. We can pay for this. It's about political will. So I want to thank everybody for coming here today. Um, I'm looking, looking forward to answering any questions uh, that you may have. Uh, but until then, I'd like to pass it over to my colleague, Daniel Blakey. Thank you very much. Bonjour tout le monde. Merci d'être ici uh, avec nous. Nous sommes ici aujourd'hui pour parler d'un revenu de base garantie suffisant pour tous les Canadiens et Canadiennes. Um, C'est quelque chose que... Nous avons maintenant un peu d'expérience avec, étant donné l'expérience du PCU. Ça n'a pas encore couvert tout le monde qui a besoin d'être couvert. Parce qu'on sait que la pauvreté détruit les vies. On sait que la pauvreté a des vrais coûts et que nous payons déjà beaucoup d'argent pour les effets de la pauvreté et qu'on ne va jamais régler le problème de pauvreté sans, sans adresser la, la question d'un revenu de base. So I'm very happy to be here today with my colleague, uh, Leah Gazan, and I want to thank her for her work in developing 
an excellent bit of legislation that would finally see government take responsibility for developing a framework for a guaranteed livable basic income in Canada. There are a lot of factors that contribute to poverty, people finding themselves experiencing poverty and being stuck in the system of poverty. But we're never going to solve that problem without solving the question of income. It's a necessary part of any real solution to the problem of poverty. And we have to solve poverty. We have to solve it because it's destroying lives. We've heard so many stories recently in the media of people who already were struggling at the financial margins but have, were plunged further into poverty as a result of government clawbacks of pandemic benefits. Stories of people losing their home just as they got a cancer diagnosis and have been struggling to pay their medications. Stories of people who have been seeking help from their MPs even as they learned to live in their car in the Northwest Territories at the onset of winter. These stories, I think, for many Canadians have given them a fresher perspective on what people who have been struggling with poverty and those working with people experiencing poverty have known forever. But going back at least to the late 1980s, when NDP leader Ed Broadbent at the time was successful in getting the House of Commons to say that we should end child poverty by the year 2000. The year 2000 is long come and gone. We haven't addressed the problem of child poverty. One in five children in Canada today are living in poverty. And this is a problem we need to solve. As I say, we're not going to solve it without addressing the question of income for every Canadian. It's a question not just of money, but a question of dignity. And New Democrats want to live in a country where everyone is afforded the basic dignity that human beings deserve. And we can't do that in a country with such a high level of poverty. People ask, of course, well, how much is this going to cost? And it's a fair question. We're not proposing that we price out a program like this on the back of a napkin. Excellent organizations like Basic Income Canada have already done a lot of deep thinking and reporting out on how we might pay for something like this. But the bill that's being proposed here today by my colleague, Ms. Gazan, asks to deploy the resources of government to figure out a plan for what would be a reasonable basic income guarantee and how government might go about paying for it. It's a question of political will. And this bill is about galvanizing that political will so that we can finally get a government to turn its attention to the problem rather than do what we've seen it do even over the question of pandemic benefits, which is to turn its back and retreat even as more and more people need assistance. It's about having the government finally take accountability and measure the cost of poverty, the cost that it is already costing us. When we think of people who live in homelessness, even five years ago, there was a calculation done that said in Winnipeg, it, it was costing taxpayers $150 a day for every person living in homelessness. That's a lot of money. That's well, that means that taxpayers are paying for every person who's homeless over twice what it would cost to have a guaranteed livable basic income for that person that would allow them to support themselves in their own home with dignity. So we are paying a very high cost to refuse people their human rights and their dignity. And this bill is about taking accountability for that and finding a way to support people that gives them dignity and thinking hard about, yeah, how we pay for that. But look, we had the Parliamentary Budget Officer report out last week and say that 1% right now of Canada's population enjoys 25% of the wealth that's produced in this country every year. And 40% of the population is asked to share just 1%. Surely that's wrong. And there hasn't been enough talk about that in the House of Commons. We hear a lot of talk about various macroeconomic concepts that are depersonalized and cover over the fact that real lives of real people here in Canada are being destroyed every day by poverty. So I welcome this bill as an important reminder of those people who deserve to have a voice in this place. 
I welcome it as a call to government to be accountable for the lives that are being destroyed by poverty because governments are making decisions to concentrate more and more wealth in the hands of people at the top and let less and less of that wealth be shared among the rest of us. And I think that's what is so important in this bill. And I want to thank my colleague, Ms. Gazan, again, for all the work that she's done to put together what I think is a very credible step forward on the path to, uh, to making this a reality in Canada. Thank you. Now we're ready for question, operator. Is there any question? We have no questions registered at this time. Nous n'avons aucune question pour le moment. This concludes the press conference.